Specters, welcome to the Mass Effect lore cast. This is your source for the lore and information about the Mass Effect series. I am your host, Tom, or Robots, and I'm here as usual with Sam, the N7 legend. Sam, congratulations, buddy. We got to celebrate. You got affiliate on Twitch. <laughs> yeah, I did. Uh, thanks. And uh, I think it happened like, you know, way quicker than I ever imagined it would. But that's definitely due to the amazing supportive community that has come from this podcast. So I yeah. want to say thank you to all of our fans uh, for helping me get there in like, you know, light speed. No pun intended. Light but, speed. You know, Faster than light speed, maybe. Faster even. than an FTL speed. Ooh, ooh. They had a massive effect yeah, it's, on the speed at which I reached affiliate. It's like they had a uh, relay where they worked <laughs> together in order to get you to this destination. They propelled me mm -hmm. to amateurdom, mm -hmm. amateur startup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that you would have a, um, a stream that is basically a citadel of Mass Effect content. Yes. Yes. And by the way, I don't know if any of you guys knew this, but the rest of this episode is just going to be puns about that. It's just so. us using words for Mass Effect in ways that don't even that make less and less sense. Um, but welcome, everybody. We are back. We have some fun news for you today in the middle of the show because we are announcing a giveaway and we will give you instructions on the fun way that you can enter the giveaway. <laughs> which is, is going to be awesome. And also, uh, right at the top of the show, another another wonderful success. We are up to 18 patrons already on Patreon. You guys are freaking amazing. Holy crap. Thank you, everybody, for your support. That is phenomenal. We have uh, we have patrons at all the different levels, almost. Um, even a bunch of you are going to be joining us at the end of the month on the 27th, the last Sunday of the month, to, to talk. Uh, and again, we are live. It's 10.30 p.m. Eastern on twitch.tv slash robots radio. So, and... Krager, 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 maybe. Thank you for the subscription. Ever this, this whole, this whole thing is just exploding. Everything's blowing up like a starship under way too much fire in space. Like the Normandy SR one mm, at, yeah, the, at the end uh, of beginning of Mass Effect two. The, yeah, well, the beginning of you're right, beginning of Mass Effect. Yeah, that's, spoilers. Spoilers. Uh, so anyway, uh, talking about spoilers. What are we talking about today? <laughs> Today, we're going to be talking about uh, the Turians, who I kind of teased it on, on Twitter a little bit, but, you know, they are the tall, dutiful, imposing, rigid, cool, but collected, peacekeeping bird people of the council. <laughs> I've never thought of them as bird people, but they are kind of birdy, aren't they? <laughs> they're they're avian-like. Yeah. They're velociraptor-like. Mm, yeah, almost, yeah, a little bit more in that, like, bridge between dinosaur and bird. So they're somewhere yeah. in there. Yeah. And it's funny you should say that. That's exactly how Captain David Anderson thought of them. Hmm. Uh, and that's revealed in Mass Effect Revelation. He always considered the Turians to be the missing link between birds and dinosaurs. Yeah, they, they're kind of, they've got aspects of both. Yeah. Seemingly. Yep. And, uh, you know, if, you know, the last lore episode, we talked about the Salarians. And I said that they embodied the mantra, uh, knowledge is power. Well, if the Salarians embody that, then the Turians are examples of space Bushido. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, for anyone that doesn't know, Bushido is, I think, most concisely summed up as the Eastern version of chivalry. Okay. Yeah, I think that's probably a pretty solid yeah, explanation. I could go, you know, you could take entire courses on exactly what Bushido is and mm -hmm. what it isn't. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you want to delve into the details there, maybe find a Bushido podcast. <laughs> <laughs> the B Bushido Lorecast coming soon. Um, but yeah, uh, talking about like honor, chivalry, yeah. those kinds of concepts you would yeah, associate it, with something it was like Bushido. Basically a, it was a philosophy um, embraced by the samurai of right. feudal Japan. So um, if you think along those lines, you'll already be halfway to understanding the Turians, I think. Uh, but let's back up a little bit and let's discuss the physiological features as we've been doing so far. Mm -hmm. The Turians are bipedal. As I've said before, that's the case with most intelligent species in the Citadel, or I'm sorry, rather in the, in the entire galaxy. And the two competing theories in the game are that Bipedal life has proliferated because either A, the Protheans intervened and made it proliferate, and the Protheans made bipedalism uh, proliferate because they themselves are bipedal and, you know, they thought that was the best and whatever. 
or the other school of thought is that there was some evolutionary advantage to ha- to standing upright on two legs and that's why it proliferated and that makes the most the sense more, to me yeah most of the the standard conventional school of thought within the mass effect universe is the latter um how do you pick things terrain, up if you don't have hands and arms to do it right <laughs> Well, the Elcor uh, walk on all fours, and they actually carry things on their back. Uh, but we will be talking about the Elcor <laughs> another week. They are, you know, uh, well, fine. Uh, there's an there's a counter example in the in the galaxy, but okay. <laughs> um, yeah, the, they really thought of everything. The writers thought of everything. Um, however, the, one of the things that does make the Turians unique is that they are dextro protein based. Most life on Earth is levo or levo protein, uh, levo amino acid based, and and that's getting into the really nitty gritty of science, scientific details. But basically, what this means is the effect is that medicine and pharmaceuticals included, uh, as well as food, must all be different so that they can con- they can consume it, and there's no uh, anaphylactic shock or there's no you know digestive issues. Um, I thought of a, a funny, I don't know, parallel in that if the Turians are bird-like and they look bird-like and they have problems, uh, digesting food that would be meant for humans, Asari or Salarians mm-hmm. who are all levo amino based, uh, levo, levo amino acid based, then I wonder if that means that the Turians also practice things that other birds do. Like some birds eat rocks so that they can digest, <laughs> like it can break up the food yeah. in their digestive tract. So I, I would wonder if like Turians also sometimes eat rocks if they're like, oh crap, I just ate something meant for a solarian. Now I gotta eat a rock. Yeah, like, oh, my stomach. Ugh. Does anybody got any rocks? <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> that's, that's their Tums. You mean gum? <laughs> tums? Like what? No, rocks. I need, I need rocks. Uh, yeah, like limestone, dude. Yeah, yeah, like granite. So uh, one, this is interesting. Real quick note: um, dextro is Latin for right, and levo is Latin for left. So huh. molecularly, levo means your DNA spiral shaped to the left, and uh, or left would be this way, right? And then um, dextro, your your DNA spiral shaped to the right. So the the proteins and how they function with DNA and and basically the way your body works from that level outward would be the opposite which That's pretty sounds awesome. crazy i did not know that yeah there's actually one other uh race in the mass effect universe like this but there's only one uh sapien race that is and that is the koreans um we briefly discussed the korean the koreans in the geth war episode we will be giving them their their own episodes certainly um and that is to come. Uh, but about the Turians, their most distinctive feature, I think, is their body type. They're very tall. And unlike the Solarians, I believe the games that did a great job of depicting this. However, one, the most distinguishing feature of their body has got to be their metallic carapace. I'm saying that right, right? A carapace? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's it's like an exoskeleton. And for for those who are who are having a hard time maybe picturing this, think of a lobster shell. Uh, that's similar to the material that that's on Turians and that covers their back. You see that they're all of the Turians have humps, kind of hump-looking mm-hmm. things on their backs. That's carapace, and it has a functional reason. Um, the reason why Turians have carapace and the exoskeleton and the plates on their face is because it protects them against radiation. Their home world of Palavin had a weak magnetic field because of some difference in its metallic core uh, of the planet. So more radiation penetrated the atmosphere in Palavin and that presented the necessity for evolution to create a mitigation factor for long-term radiation yeah protective layer yeah um a really fun fact about their carapace and i discovered this actually from and i'm going to send you a link here tom so that you might be able to show your screen okay um but there's a really cool fact about the carapace and it contains an uh, um, an element called thulium and I'm not sure how many chemist fans we have here listening, but basically the presence of thulium might indicate that, and thulium is also uh, present in Euro banknotes, 
and it's 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 present there as a measure against counterfeiting because when it's exposed to uv light it glows so depending on the level of thulium in an individual's carapace this could mean that turians actually glow under uv light uh-huh right right so this image right here with the circles and the different amount of uh blue is this the image you were talking about that is that is uh the image so it, it, it might be that 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 Turians might glow around that kind of indigo violet color if exposed to UV light. Mm -hmm. um, so you put them in a, them a in a terrifying. <laughs> you put them in a in a rave and they just light the place up like the black lights. Just they walk in through a black light and they're just like. Poof. Now I understand why all the bartenders on the Citadel are are Turian because you're <laughs> you're never gonna lose sight of them. <laughs> Where's the bar? Oh, yeah, there's the bartender. Right, bartender <laughs> just look for the, the glowing yeah. guy that's awesome um so you know with an exoskeleton meant to block long-term radiation and also one that apparently glows if exposed to uv light um you might envision that these turians have a pretty rough exterior but their carapace isn't hard enough to block conventional bullets like in our own universe let alone mass effect field generating weapons it's not armor it's not like Krogan's, uh, I think Krogan have some harder level of, of external skin. It's harder to break through. It's not like that. It's more like really, really thick skin. Mm -hmm. And in, and they can still feel vibrations through it. The reason that we know this, and this is canon, <laughs> is that Turians actually get massages like humans do, but it requires a hammer. <laughs> that's great that's great yeah um so it requires a hammer and someone literally just pounds away at their back mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of how turians get massages and that much is canon uh but i was trying to corroborate this detail and i was trying to find secondary sources and i won't lie to you i found a fan fiction erotica about it online <laughs> oh no Hey, not really my speed, but I'm not going to knock you for it if that's what you're into. And it's you always know. a surprise uh, when you're looking for something else, right? It you're is, like, what? Um, oh, oh, <laughs> okay. It was, thankfully, it was all text. Uh, that was nice. It spared me some visuals. But uh, if you're into fanfic about Turian human relationships and weird hammer massages, then go for it. Uh, but yeah. uh, the, the Turians... Uh, they might be inclined to recreational massages like humans are. However, they look a lot scarier than humans. At least that's my opinion as a human. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, being soft, squishy, we're made out of soft, squishy stuff, you know, like compared to the way they look. Right. It and, looks like it know, must be rough, right? It looks like the kind of thing that like... More covered in hair than others, but... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't protect but, you the way that like hard hardened no. skin or scales or something would no and and i think their eyes are pretty distinctive too um turian irises are very intense looking they're almost you know like fearsome and i think you combine different facets of of turian physiology and you get something you you can analyze it uh that to get to get a picture that's really predator like you know you can see through their mandibles. You can see their mm -hmm. razor sharp teeth. You mm -hmm. can see their jaws, which look pretty powerful. And they have two front facing eyes, which we know through biology is a uh, characteristic of not prey, but predator. Right. right. And uh, yeah. their bodies are very slender. So it looks like they like I'm just guessing here, but it looks like Turians are fast as hell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they look like the um, the cool athletic hunter race of the galaxy you know yeah they do yeah they, they they certainly do um and their their legs are similar to corians in that they have a little uh appendage that comes off the back toward the calf and i would guess that that i'm not an anthropologist but i would guess that that is to counterbalance them so that they can run faster mm -hmm. um and turians as far as i know don't have tails um so they don't need that kind of balance going behind them. But the other very, very unique thing and very distinguishable characteristic about Turians is their voice. It has what the wiki calls a flanging effect. A flan uh, flanging, like a, fl a flanger. Flanging. Yeah, so in, um, in music, like a guitar effect, you can have something that's called a flanger effect. 
on your on the notes of your guitar. And this is the same thing that's happening with their voices. So I basically, and maybe you can correct my understanding of this, but I read a little bit on it and it, and it sounds like it, it's created from almost like two different frequencies playing at once. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's similar to a chorus effect, whereas a chorus is two of the same take slightly shifted off of each other. So it sounds like multiple voices at the same time or multiple notes that are playing un- uniformly. Flanging is when they're off slightly when it comes to uh pitch i believe so there's a slight variance in the pitch while they Ah, while it speaks so there's almost like a little bit of dissonance um yeah it's it's almost like a like a uh, it it blends between harmonic and dissonant as it it's like a wobbling almost yeah so i think um we can probably describe this all day but it's probably easier to show the uh people who are listening in what we mean and so i've i have a link that i just sent to tom and and basically what this is it's a great conversation that shepherd can have with garris toward the end of mass effect 3. um i i scanned it i don't think it's spoiler heavy but if you're really scared about spoilers toward the end of mass effect 3 maybe avert your ears now or skip the next minute 30. yeah so hopefully this comes through pretty clearly i'm going to make sure that the volume's up on it on it here you go shepherd so i guess this is just like old times. <laughs> huh. Uh, hmm. Might be the last chance we get to say that. Think we're gonna lose? No, I think we're about to kick the Reapers back into whatever black hole they crawled out of. Then we're going to retire somewhere warm and tropical and live off the royalties from the vids. I'll meet you there. <laughs> I think my days of saving Thanks for the follow, are right? when this is done. Be sure to leave room for all the autographs. <laughs> Just need to beat the Reapers to get there. James told me there's an old saying here on Earth. May you be in heaven half an hour before the devil knows you're dead. Not sure if Torian heaven is the same as yours, but if this thing goes sideways and we both end up there, meet me at the bar. I'm by. We're a team, Garrus. There's no Shepard without Vicarian, so you better remember to duck. Sorry, Turians don't know how, but I'll improvise. And Shepard, forgive the insubordination, but this old friend has an order for you. Go out there and give them hell. You were born to do this. Goodbye, Garrus. And if I'm up there in that bar and you're not, I'll be looking down. I'll always have your back. So yeah, that's the clip. You can tell in uh, in the way he's talking that it almost sounds like there's two voices, and one is a little bit lower than the other. Almost. Does that make sense? Oh, are you muted? You're muted. Oh, there you yeah, go. Yeah, it does. <laughs> so I had muted myself to make sure that didn't uh, interject on the on the audio. But yeah, it does make sense. And in fact, uh, Mark Muir confirmed that. Uh, Mark Meir is the voice of Commander, male Commander Shepard. He hosted a live chat on Instagram this week uh, that I attended, and he was basically, it was a live autograph signing. And he said that anyone can actually sound like a Turian as their production team primarily made overlays with just studio effects. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyone can sound like a Turian. Yeah, yeah, you just have to pitch shift yourself and then have a second track underneath you identical to the first track. So it sounds like your voice here and your voice here saying exactly the same thing. I wonder if you could stream that way. Uh, I don't think I have an effect in my board, but um, I'm sure you could. I'm sure if you played with program setting is enough. Uh, So it's like some of the robot settings, I think, do a flange effect. And you could probably figure it out if you have a soundboard or uh, there's even some software you can get that allows you to tweak some of those settings. But yeah, absolutely. It's not a it's not a hard effect to do. And like I said, you can do it with a guitar pedal. You could run your microphone through a guitar pedal and then into your soundboard and just click the flange effect and play with it like that. But man, I always thought that uh, Turians had like some of the coolest sounding voices in the whole series. Um, just because they're they're this militaristic culture, right? And they're very, and you even heard Gareth say it, forgive the insubordination, which is a huge thing. And that's one of the reasons why I picked that exact uh, piece of dialogue because we'll be talking about it later in the second half of the show but 
um, insubordination, knowing your your place in society, very important for Turian culture. Um, so hearing Garrus talk about that and we're kind of breaking those social molds, that's a big deal for a Turian to do. And that, that kind of illustrates how close he feels with Shepard. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Very great. I, I just love that conversation. Honestly, that's I think the first time I ever played through Mass Effect 3, that conversation got me misty eyed. Like, have you ever seen that meme where, where the guy's like crying and he's saluting? Like, <laughs> that's yeah. that's the meme that I thought of. Um, so that that conversation is just something else. But you know, I think if you were to imagine an alien species that was bird like and had avian features, mm-hmm. and and even their mouth kind of resembles a flat beak to to a certain extent then you would kind of give them that voice. That voice kind of matches up. It makes sense for like a a bird velociraptor samurai species. (laughs) Yeah. There's, there's something about the, the way the characters look that has this, I don't know, uh, maybe the way the mouth works that somehow makes the voice seem like it makes sense. Like it's coming out of something that's hard. If does that, I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense. Like there's something about the tone of the voice. That's just a little bit hard. And so well, it makes sense with the face plates because the face plates are a bit jagged. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and then, you know, the outside of their bodies looks rough and, and hard, almost like, uh, like it, when you, when you talk in a room and it echoes, there's that quality of hearing your own voice. And then it, it bounced back to yourself that the two voices together is and the flange does something very similar to that. I don't know. It's yeah, kind of spitballing. I think they did a great job with the post-production effects, kind of creating the Turians' voice. And um, they actually Turians also have a. So it's it's funny that that Garrus brings up, you know, if you know if if you're in heaven and I'm not, or, or if, you know, vice versa. Mm-hmm. It's funny that he brings that up because Turians have a very similar lifespan to humans, which in the Mass Effect universe is about 140 to 150 years. Yeah. Which is interesting because there is a study that came out recently that pegs the uh, full extent of human life at being around 150 years. That's what they're anticipating, like without any like extra means of, say, like refreshing your DNA strands or your protein or whatever. I don't know, whatever the other stuff that goes on there just through, um, you know, medical needs and diet and things like that, that we will see. A, at some point in you know human existence we will see an upper range of 150 year lifespans wow that's amazing Did yeah. that, that study came out recently so yeah, there probably was an the writer about that. didn't see that you know when they no, no. developed the first game right yeah nice guess yeah. i mean there are people <laughs> nice who guess. live into the you know 100 teens now like the oldest living person was 117 or something i might be wrong so about i heard that. yeah something like that uh, um, so i heard and that's that's amazing that's nothing short of incredible but um turians apparently would be living the same length as us if they existed right now um and their heads are you know we we talked about every other physiological aspect of them i think and finally their heads their faces as i mentioned are covered in the carapace uh and there's a way for us humans to tell the difference between males and females specifically because of the carapace on their face and heads males have crowns of carapace and sometimes depicted as long protruding spikes that cover the top of their heads and sometimes they extend far behind their heads i believe it's the case with garris Mm -hmm. uh female female turians do not have that quality and that's a bit i don't know if you want to call it a retcon but it's something that the developers create or uh, decided upon actually in mass effect 3 because before mass effect 3 there wasn't a single female turian depicted in the games and the associate art director or maybe it was the art director um themselves they they had clarified and said there wasn't enough bandwidth on the project to create two versions of every race yeah and so out of necessity they just made the male turians interesting Um, okay obviously that's no longer the case uh with three and andromeda now yeah Uh, but i've been keeping a lookout for female turians in mass effect one and two so far i haven't seen any if any of our fans have in the first two games in legendary edition please let me know um 
But yeah, I, as far as I've seen, I have not seen any female Turians in Mass Effect 1, 2, Legendary Edition. And maybe that's because it would have been a little bit out of place. Like they kind of cut a picture out of a magazine and put it in a different magazine. If they took one asset from one game and put it in the other, I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I'm guessing we're not going to see any in the first two and them adding it in seems like they would have had to add in the models and the textures and, um, yeah. and the, they're, they're pretty, they're pretty straightforward recreations of those games with a few little tweaks here and there. Yeah. I'm guessing that we, we wouldn't see that kind of thing, uh, either. Uh, and there's one more quality that's on Turian's heads that we have all seen before. Whenever we met a Turian, whether that be executor Palin, Garrus, uh, whether it be the general we meet in Kors Din, whether it be Nyrene that we meet in Omega, there's one quality that pretty much all Turians have in common, and that's their face paint. Mm -hmm. And when we come back from the mid break, we're going to be discussing some aspects of Turian society, including the face paint. And why does it seem like every single Turian wears a different style? What do they mean? And where do those styles come from? I'll, I'll just uh, tease it at this, that the, uh, the style has a meaning and has a historical significance. Uh, and there's a reason why almost everyone wears one, but we'll, we'll cover that when we come back. All right. Sounds good. Let's move into the middle of the show and we'll be back with some more Turian stuff in a little bit. Message coming in. Patching it through. I am sovereign and this station is mine. I like the sound of that. All right, so I teased a giveaway that we will be doing at the beginning of the show, and we will, at the end of this mid-break, we'll be going over the details on that, so stay tuned for that. But first, we have to do what is absolutely most important and thank all of our patrons. You guys are phenomenal. All 18 of you who have signed up already for the Patreon, it, we just launched this not that long ago, and you guys jumped on top of this. There's all sorts of rewards you can get. You can get episodes early. You can get ad free episodes. You can sign up uh, tier four and higher, get to join us on a future episode of the show. So that's coming up on the 27th of the, this month and all sorts of other fun things going on there. So go check out patreon.com slash mass effect lorecast for more ways that you can help us support, help support us so that we can keep doing this, but then also get some really cool stuff for yourselves as well. And um, our, I also have to thank specifically sovereign wonderful name for being our tier five supporter that is absolutely amazing welcome to the patreon thank you for for joining us and for supporting us at that tier uh every week our tier five supporters will get called out and i have to also mention um i don't know that i've thanked everybody by name yet i don't know that i've done that we should just go down the list of all 18 of you guys and, and tell every one of you thank you so we have and this is uh, just going down the tier list. We have Sovereign. We have Justin D. Kather N. So Thana Toasted. That's our, our good friend Toasty. Uh, Alexander. Andre M. Ben E. Alina R. Jessica R. Uh, MK10 Gamer. Caleb. John W. Dub w. Not W. Who am I? George Bush. W. Um, Justin W. <laughs> John W. and Justin W. Lupus Malum. Uh, Mar Marcel H. N7 Stormtrooper 22. That's an interesting juxta juxtaposition there. Rebel Scum 1138. Uh, don't tell the Stormtrooper that the Rebel Scum is here. And then Remington C. Thank you to all of you. You guys are amazing. Thank you so very much for your support. And then also, we need to call out some, some reviews that have come in, including one that I missed from back in april um and thanks for reminding me about this uh, Bro uh brocco daily from the united states i'm so bad with names guys I, I apologize i do this on my other shows too where i'm just like ah, i can't read this name but i'm just gonna try it anyway um they wrote prime five stars I stumbled upon this podcast while jonesing for my next Mass F fix. <laughs> get it? Something to get me to May 14th was a hope, but I come away every week somehow more and more impressed with Robots and N7 Legends' thoughtful and intelligent discussion, detailed analysis, and enjoyable speculation on the series, the races, and characters across this truly expansive universe. Mass Effect single-handedly got me into sci-fi when the repetitive nature of things like Star Wars had just never done it for me. 
The depth of this universe, the extreme detail of each race, culture, and historical conceit is only surpassed by how intriguing a picture it paints across all three games. These two podcasters truly have their work cut out for them, but have met the challenge wonderfully, covering not just the facts, but the sociological ramifications, the philosophy, the real world connections, and the cultural impact such events would have in fiction. It makes this weekly podcast such a wholesome and intriguing experience. I know when the legendary edition releases, my time with Shepard and the Normandy will be so much richer and deeper thanks to the work of this wonderful podcast. Cheers, guys. Man, that is that is a very intense, in-depth review. So thank you very, very much, Brocco Daily. Awesome stuff. And then we have a few more here. Um, I'm not sure we called this one out last week. It came in on Sunday, which is when we do the show. This one's from Drew Powell, 77. If, uh, Sam, if I, if this sounds familiar, uh, remind me. We did not call it out. We didn't call it out. Um, so from the U S uh, writes amazing, more mass effect, five stars. I love this podcast, but I'm a sucker for anything mass effect. My only complaint would be that sometimes they get too sidetracked with the real life parallels and spend more time talking about the real life cons- concepts. And we did talk about this. Didn't we? And I'd like to hear more about the mass effect universe, but N seven legend does a good job telling the story that I absolute and I absolutely love it. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Some people. Yeah, sorry, I thought that was the. That's probably the next one. I thought it was. Yeah, that came on Monday, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And that's just a funny note is that some people don't like uh, the other stuff so much, but I like to sprinkle in some real world insight into the things connected to the, uh, the lore, but eh, teach their own. Um, then we have from the mock in the United States who writes great show. Five stars really enjoyed this show. I leave every episode with some new context and nuggets of lore to pay attention to as I play through the legendary edition. Contrary to some other reviews, I greatly appreciate your inclusive approach, even your non assumptions about pronouns. This franchise made headlines for the ways in which it it embraced gamers of all kinds of backgrounds. It's super appropriate and important that this show does the same for the listeners. Thank you for that means a lot. Well, you're very welcome. I'm glad you appreciate both of those things because we try to, we try to, you know, you can't please everybody all the time. Didn't Lincoln say something about that? Um, but we're doing the best we can. And at least you guys appreciate it. So so thanks for that. And we've got one more from Krager Maker, Maka? Krager Maka, I think, in the United States, who writes, Smother Me in Lore, five stars. Mass Effect is my all-time favorite series. Back in the day, I got into all the transmedia and just lived and breathed Mass Effect. After many years away from this amazing world, I'm being pulled back in by the Legendary Edition. I'm glad I came across this podcast to help refresh my memory of lore and sometimes hear a different perspective. Thank you for breaking down these classic stories for me and for being part of my return to this beloved trilogy well you're very welcome for that and thank you to all of you for taking the time to do that uh everyone who has signed up everybody who has helped us out in any way possible our success is completely dependent on you guys i mean we don't pay to advertise this show so us being able to do this is a hundred percent based on on your support and you know even just sharing it with your friends so thank you very very much for all of that and to celebrate with a giveaway at the end of the month we will be picking a winner and the winner will be picked based on who can submit to us on our discord in the mass effect Lorecast channel of our discord and everybody has access to it you can it's, there's a link in the show notes you can just even just google robots radio discord and you can log right in on a browser you can use an app you can get into it all sorts of different ways it's basically a forum and you can go down to the mass effect Lorecast section and i would like you guys to share in there your best recreations of each of us as Commander Shepard. So you can make a N7 Legend Shepard and a Robot Shepard. And we want to see what you come up with. We want you to, and you and, and if you don't know what our faces look like because you listen to the audio version of this show, you can check out each of our streams. So I stream at twitch.tv slash robots radio and uh, N7 streams at twitch.tv slash N7 The Legend. You can check out this show on the Robots Radio YouTube, so you can see our faces on there because every episode shows up on there. Um, I don't always wear a hat. I've got dark hair, (laughs) right? And I've got some facial hair. Um, (laughs) And Seven here has blonde hair and blonde eyebrows, which is going to be another interesting thing that you're going to have to figure out how to deal with. And you guys just, just start up a new game, a new save make a shepherd for each of us take a screenshot or a picture with your camera and just share it 
on the Discord. And we're going to have an amazing time looking at all of these wonderful versions of us in the game. And if they look terrible, please submit them anyway, because it's going to be hilarious. But if they look awesome and we, we will we will deliberate on this. So we will do this. Let's say we, you've got until the 27th, until our patron episode and on our patron episode live, we will pick the winners and we will show some of our favorites as well. And it's going to be super fun. So and um. Sam, you, you had one caveat. You had one thing that you said has to happen. Here, I'll take off my hat, too, so you guys can see it. But what was the oh, yeah. one thing that has to happen? So I reserve the right <laughs> to pick the best depiction of, of me. Um, and I want the code for the face in that screenshot, because if it's if it's really good, mm -hmm. I, I want to take the code and I want to recreate the shepherd. So then that way I can recreate that shepherd and play that shepherd on stream. Uh, and that'll be every stream. I'll throw out a thank you to whoever made that shepherd. That's awesome. That'll be awesome. Yeah. Um, Decodes in, in chat said, what does Tom, Tom's hair look like? So I took off my hat. I have kind of shortish, you know, it's very, very dark. It's almost black hair. I'm going to, so I'm not Hispanic, but I have a feeling when you get a lot of Hispanic looking <laughs> Tom shepherds. <laughs> because you know, the, the dark facial hair and the dark you know dark eyes i think both of our haircuts are already pre-made haircuts in probably probably like, like, i think they all already are yeah they're very similar i mean we've got kind of the shaved sides and kind of a little bit longer yeah. on top kind of thing so yeah i'm, I'm, I'm we are pretty NPCs. sure you can yeah you can find those i'm sure so yeah there you go there's no high and tight though yeah mm. So anyway, yeah, we please start submitting them. If we get some tonight, that would be phenomenal. That would be amazing. I would love to even just like as we get them in on future streams, just kind of show a few of them, you know, whether it's this show or just us playing games it'd be like, hey, look what came in and just popping it up on stream for people to check out. That'd be a lot of fun, too. All right. We've got some more Turian stuff to talk about. I'm interested in this whole face paint thing. I've got some theories because I didn't look ahead in the notes about this topic. So it's going to be a surprise for me. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that as well. So here we go. Spit it out, or are you trying to build suspense? You're so dense, sir. Obviously, I do not know as much about human relationships as I thought. All right, we're back. Let's see. What do we? So, what is this whole thing about the face paint? So, the face paint is kind of a critical element of their society. It's much more important than one might guess because it's not mentioned a whole lot in the games through dialogue. Almost all Turians have it, as I've said. Uh, and the origins of this face paint go back to a series of internal conflicts between Turian colonies called the Unification Wars. Basically, the Turians had discovered the Citadel, you know, around 900 of the current era. Um, and they had all, but before then, they had already been expanding through space. And they all, already had colonies in multiple systems. Uh, but the problem was that as the colonies grew further from the reach of their homeworld's government, which is called the Turian hierarchy, they began forming new state identities and the colonists were governed by their own chieftains. And then they started forming rivalries against other colonies. And according to the wiki, colonists began wearing emblems or facial markings to differentiate themselves from members of other colonies and open hostilities became common. So uh -huh. that that's kind of the origins of where the face paints come from and why there's a bunch of different designs, although it's not currently known which designs lead back to which colony coincide. So it's, it's, it's almost like a tribal thing is, is really what it yeah, is. Yeah, almost. And uh, even though those colonies and those kind of affiliations don't exist anymore. And, and more or less every Turian identifies first as a member of the hierarchy. The wars did erupt and they lasted for several, several years. And that started around 500 BCE. Mm -hmm. That should give you a, uh, that, that itself is a point that we should mention that. So these, the Turians had been exploring space from the year 500 BCE to 900 BCE when they finally found 
the citadel 400 years of exploration yeah that's quite a while yeah um yeah one side thing here we didn't even mention what we're actually giving away i forgot to do that i was so excited about seeing funny pictures of ourselves (laughs) we'll be giving away a 50 dollars gift card to the platform of your choice so if you are you know want 50 bucks for steam or xbox or playstation uh that's that'll be the reward so um pretty solid reward for some easy for easy work well I don't know how easy it is to make us, but it shouldn't take that long. <laughs> but anyway, let's get back to it. So 400 years of exploration. That's that's a well, actually more than that, because it's 500 BC. Oh, to BCE, not not common era. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so before the common era, um, 1400 yeah. years, 1400. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so they were exploring space and colonizing for 1400 years before they even found the Citadel. Uh, so they, so the Turian in total, the Turian civilization has been around for about 15,000 years. And initially during these, these colony, these unification wars, they're called the hierarchy refuses to get involved and kind of maintains a diplomatic arm's length. Uh, but things get bloody enough and eventually only a handful of colonies are left. And the hierarchy finally jumps in the mix and, you know, to preserve the union, as we would say. And the local leaders are just too battle worn to resist. Mm. So they they basically round everyone up real quick. And uh, those wars don't last long. Um, And even though they only lasted several years, the animosity lasts for decades. And the practice of face paint exists even now. And it's to the point where if you don't wear face paint and you're a Turian, it's like heavily frowned upon. You might get ostracized and outcast from society. The Turians even have a term called barefaced in their language. And it means to, uh, it refers to someone who is beguiling or should not be trusted. And that same term, that barefaced term is also slang for politicians. Oof, oof, and it's and it's bear b a r e, not a large furry forest dwelling mammal. I'm not even sure that like like <laughs> they have like bears. grizzly bears <laughs> would grizzly would grizzly bears even be a threat to Turians? I don't know. Like they already look like predators. I feel like uh, a number of Turians could take down a bear. Yeah, maybe one. Yeah, how many of yous would it take to take down? That's like the opposite question of like how many squirrels would it take to you know to beat you in a fight you know like <laughs> yeah, how many turians does it take to kill a bear to kill a bear uh, weapons no Twitter weapons poll. yeah no just, just bare bare fisted hmm <laughs> i don't know yeah that should be a twitter poll how many turians does it take man but that's I also like that's interesting stuff though the whole uh face painting I, I i get the sense that like once this worked itself into society it was a very clear understanding of what side you were on where you came from and if you didn't do that then it made sense that you weren't trustworthy because somebody couldn't simply read your face to know where your you know loyalties lie yeah and it it reminds me a lot of the eastern Bloc uh during ussr rule that was a societies rather completely based on trust trust was more valuable than a ruble at that time or Mm -hmm. even 10 rubles you needed to trust someone and if someone was unwilling to identify themselves um especially in in turian society then how do you know that they weren't operating clandestinely you know um some type of uh spy ring or something like that there was some reason why they weren't identifying themselves but i I do like the implication that turians also distrust their politicians oh yeah Uh, oh yeah that much is hilarious yeah that that is also i I think that's a universal thing right (laughs) Like, well, actually, not for the Asari. The not Asari, for the Asari. seem to have a great, a, a huge level of political legitimacy, I guess you'd call it, in their leaders. Um, maybe that's because it's kind of against Asari culture to voice discontent in a raucous way. Maybe it's because they live for a thousand years, so they figure whatever. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. I'm not sure, but it doesn't seem like a. Hmm. You know, I, I know that as soon as I say this, there's going to be some um, fan who's even more skilled in the lore than I am. And they're going to say, hey, you know, actually, there was this one Asari protester on, on this planet. Um, and, you know, if you can find that, you're absolutely right. And I'll I'll yeah, have to eat crow. Right. Well, actually, um, but, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'll be more than willing to eat crow. I've, I've done it on a number of occasions mm-hmm. and uh, it's not my last time doing it. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but moving on to their government structure, speaking of politicians, uh, the Turians are governed by something called the hierarchy, which I, I mentioned. And it is a meritocracy. That's what it says in the wiki. Uh, but this is kind of somewhere where I actually differ in opinion from the wiki. Hmm. And it's, it's, an, it's a meritocracy in name. And in, but in practice, it seems to be more of a competition of national favor with a republic reserved for the people who retain the top tiers of citizenship. And, interesting so uh, merit next- for, for other for anybody listening meritocracy the actual definition is a government or the holding of power by people selected on the basis of their ability yeah it's this the uh the soviet socialist republic was designed to be a meritocracy um by the way and and, and it didn't exactly work out but If you listen, and and I keep bringing up the USSR because the next few points really remind me of the USSR and and kind of the uh, what the East considered to be a top tier governing system throughout the decades between the 60s and the 90s. And uh, just listen to this. The Turians have 27 citizenship tiers. And they range from civilian, which is the bottom level, and that encompasses children and client races. <laughs> okay, client races are really just other races that the Turians have assimilated. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first being the Volus. The Volus are a client race of the Turians, and they ha- they handle vir- virtually all mercantile aspects of their society. The Turians can't be bothered with anything uh, trade related or entrepreneurial. They find it to be a waste of time. So they kind of outsource all of that to the to the Volus. And after they did that, their economy boomed and the Volus were happy to provide that uh, level of services. But it's not like the Volus are considered to be equals because they retain a level of citizenship, which is at the very bottom of a 27 tier system. (laughs) That's a lot of tiers. (laughs) <laughs> it is. So, you know, I, I think I already might have mentioned that Turian society is highly stratified and it's very organized. Well, this is how organized. And, you know, I'm not going to go through all 27 tiers. One, because that'd be incredibly dry. Two, because you can't even find them all. <laughs> <laughs> but, and three, uh, just because I would get exhausted and uh, it's already late for a lot of people. So. <laughs> right, but right. Anyway, the, ne- the next tier is formal citizenship. And this is important to note because formal citizenship is gained after everyone graduates boot camp. Mm-hmm. So there's like uh, mandatory military service. Right. There that's, is. What grants, uh, that's what grants on, citi- citizenship. Yeah. Starting on their 15th birthday, every Turian must go to boot camp. Uh, and the final, and and we'll get into the military a little bit, uh, in just a little bit. Um, but the final tier of citizenship is Primarch. And that is a position which governs a colonization cluster or a group of of worlds. The Primarchs are the ones who vote on national issues, but otherwise they practice a laissez-faire government, which is, uh, Mm. French for to let do. And that's basically, you know, a hands-off approach. Let the system work itself out. That's what laissez-faire means. And um, that's pretty much the way that Turians govern. Uh, the Primarchs are primarily consider- or concerned with uh, national defense, it seems like. But the Turian um, society is not a democracy by any means. It seems that only the Primarchs get a vote. Um, and then the Primarchs make these sweeping decisions and because they retain such military like authority, once the Primarchs all agree on something, change happens very progressively. Hmm. I can see why so that is why somebody would consider this a meritocracy, because you only work your way up the ranks by performance. And the only people right. who have a vote are those at the top of the ranks. So therefore, merit is what drives your ability to make governmental decisions. Yeah. Um, I, however, I can, I think I can see the justification also, for that. Yeah. It would assume, though, that, that your superiors are completely impartial, which isn't always the case. Sure. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think the Turians are isolated from party politics at all or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a quote from the wiki, which I think did a pretty good job of explaining what this system is like. Higher ranked citizens are expected to lead and protect subordinates. Lower ranking citizens are expected to obey and support superiors. Um, When I read that, 
the first thought that came to mind was of course the military that sounds very militaristic Mm -hmm. but second to that it sounds like a military dictatorship oh yeah Um, oh yeah it sounds a lot like some of the ussr satellites you know um satellite governments right Um, right or even um uh oh crap the uh the greeks um the the spartans the spartans yeah it's very spartan in a you know the i mean it's not as complex as this but it's it's based around your ability like you you only rise to prominence through your ability and and your ability especially when it comes to your military ability is what's important and the fact that they uh would basically outsource all the other things they needed to do to their slaves to the to the other groups that they conquered basically (laughs) provisions it's, of it's food, very, management of things all of that got it's out very first. close to that yeah however their military is a very broad thing um so it's not like military service always means you're going to be a soldier we'll, we'll touch on that in a little bit but yeah. first i wanted to clarify that for anyone that thinks that that this means that turians don't have any freedom that's not true turians have a lot of personal freedoms given with a caveat the freedoms are given to them as long as they complete their duties and don't interfere with others completing theirs. Mm -hmm. Uh, That sounds a lot like, you know, how's your work going, comrade? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. You You do your work, um, you do your thing. Yeah. You hold, you carry your weight. Good. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Um, and the promotions are basically job performance reviews uh given by superiors and the the interesting thing is that which really speaks to the personal uh accountability uh that's so prevalent in Turian society is that if if a superior gives someone who's not ready for it if they give them a promotion and that person is totally just not ready for those duties and they mess up that doesn't come back badly on that person in Turian society, that reflects very badly on the superior who gave you the promotion. Mm. Like they don't blame the 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 the, the subordinate, I suppose. Right. Um, not as much anyway. Okay. And demotions are rare, uh, but when it comes to the military, we already touched on it a lot. It is central to the entire society. It's not just a fighting force, though. It's it's one that encompasses all public works. This is a little bit of a socialist aspect to the Turian government. The military, however, this next part, the the military police are also the civilian police. Mm. That sounds quite fascist in nature. (laughs) It does. Uh, They they, they do indeed live in a a police state. The Turians do. Um, However, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of problem with that um there is a problem when it seems like the turian hierarchy goes to war that's a different story we're gonna have to cover that a different episode that's a very intricate topic that i was finding myself in a rabbit hole and researching today but like i mentioned every turian attends boot camp on the on his 15th his or her 15th birthday um on a micro level the military is comprised of conquered or assimilated minor races as you already guessed uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) tom because this is a practice that's been very common throughout all of human history especially with large empires like the romans and the mongolians and the persians right um and upon completion of that service uh in an auxiliary auxiliary military unit the members of other races can earn a turian citizenship or what they call citizenship which is very roman very much so yeah. um and when it comes to mentality turian soldiers are unwavering they do not give up at all uh they will retreat but only so that they can set up ambushes for you for their enemy to fall into mm-hmm. there's a popular saying in the mass effect universe you will only see a turian's back once he's dead that's metal yeah that's, <laughs> that's pretty, really really metal that's pretty awesome <laughs> I love it. Um, But now I think we're seeing a comprehensive picture come into uh, focus as to why I said the Turians practice space Bushido. Um, And on a macro level, it cemented even more. The Turians are strong, strong proponents of the overwhelming force doctrine, which to anyone who has already listened to our Krogan Rebellions episode, that comes as no surprise. 
uh, and the Turians, as, as if you haven't listened to that episode, go go and listen to it. Certainly, uh, but basically, the Turians to quell the Krogan rebellions do not hesitate to release a bioweapon that the Salarians have engineered. The Salarians aren't quite ready to release it yet. The Turians do not hesitate whatsoever. Put another way, their military doctrine states, the Turians do not believe in skirmishes or small-scale battles. They use massive fleets and numbers to defeat an adversary so completely that they remove any threat of having to fight that same opponent more than once. Whoa. Yeah, I think... uh <laughs> I mentioned him earlier, uh, George W. W. Bush would be a fan of his, their shock and awe. Oh, shock and awe, completely. And yeah. we mentioned it before, actually. I, I just remembered another episode that we did, um, the First Contact War. Mm -hmm. uh, the First Contact War, the Turians were blowing up entire city blocks of Shanxi just to take out single strike teams of Marines. Jeez. That's, right. That is the operating military doctrine of the Turian hierarchy and has been so for thousands of years. It's not going to change. Yeah. Once they fight someone, they don't want to fight them again. So they're going to make sure that they are that that person never becomes a threat again. Right. Um, you know, ironically, that that's also very American. Uh, oh yeah. yeah. I have a note in here in the notes that says it sounds a lot like what resulted in overly punitive treaties throughout history. And the first one that came to mind was the Treaty of Versailles, uh, which ended World War One, and also you know arguably allowed for the rise of of, of demagogues like Hitler. Mm -hmm. uh, because it was so punitive on the German society. Right, right. And, um, and, the, and the Germans responded in World War II with, with Blitzkrieg. I mean, it was a very similar concept. Um, it, it, was, yeah. it was mobilized. Uh, they were able to mobilize in ways that you hadn't been able to in the past, but the, the force of their armies pushing through a place were way more than, than the enemy expected and way more than, than what would have been needed in a traditional war up to that point so that they could you know basically blow through the enemy line and take out the enemy and it's also similar to the the stipulations that the united states placed on japan after world war ii mm -hmm. the, the united states placed several stipulations which existed within and still exist within the current japanese constitution which basically state that the japanese are not allowed to build a, um, a certain uh, level of military presence uh, above a certain extent um, that is the same exact idea. Make sure that your opponent never becomes a threat again. Right, right. And right. it's actually been hotly contested within Japan in the in recent years. You know, are they they've been contesting? Should we strike this uh, this 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 clause from our constitution because they have rising threats around the area? Um, maybe we should make a geopolitical podcast. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but back, back to the Turians. And sorry to that reviewer who doesn't like our um, real world <laughs> tirades. Yeah, our real, real, um, real world correlations in, in the lore. Yeah, but, I'm yeah. going to issue a customized apology. Yeah. I find to that there's a reason viewer. why, just let me address this real quick. There's a reason why I do it. And it, it is because for anybody who has experience with those things, drawing those parallels helps you to understand the fictional universe better because you can, you can take something concrete from our own world and put that onto the, the fictional world in order for you to see how similar they actually are in a lot of ways. Yeah. And I, I see, uh, that boy, uh, Jor, uh, I hope you're, I'm pronouncing your name right. Um, but he says in the chat, humans are incredibly lucky that the council stepped in and intervened during the first contact war, because had they not knowing the Turians military mantra, they probably would have gone full scale to eliminate humans. And that's exactly what was going to happen they were going to launch a planetary war against humanity and i gotta say humanity would have lost it um oh yeah during the three or four years that pass uh between mass effect one and mass effect two uh the humanity's military makes great strides and granted it depends on shepherd's decision to sacrifice some of the alliance or not at the end of mass effect one but it still doesn't come anywhere near the military might that the Turians have. Mm -hmm. um, and so as we've already noted, the military permeates every facet of their society. And I think anyone that can tell anyone that has served in the military will tell you that, of course, it's highly stratified. Of course, it's highly organized, but it's also to a certain extent collectivist. There's a quote in the wiki that pretty much sums this up pretty well. 
It says, while Turians are individuals with personal desires, their instinct is to equate the self with the group and to set aside all personal desires for the good of all. So society above self is instituted from, you know, from birth for, for Turians. And from the age of 15 to 30, every Turian has mandatory public service in a position some way or another that's working for the military. And that doesn't have to be as a soldier. As I mentioned, it could be as a government construction worker, sure. which is still part of the military. An information so the specialist, a uh, engineer, yeah, all sorts of things. It's limitless. Yeah. You know, the government has a very large number of people on its payroll for the Turian hierarchy. Uh, probably one of the reasons they needed to outsource their uh, accountants to the Volus, uh, because they can't be bothered to deal with it themselves. Mm -hmm. It's a very complicated government. But on a micro level, to the Turians, personal responsibility is paramount. It's why their species is referred to by others as disciplined and why Turian honor is an ideal discussed both in the games and within circles of its fandom. Yeah. I've seen it in several Discord groups now. This is this is very, very similar to the Bushido side of things yes. that you were talking about. This whole uh, being collectivist, but then this maintaining a personal responsibility to that, the, the two sides of that coin. Yeah, there, the, the, uh, there's an interesting dichotomy going on because it is very collectivist and yet there's a weird level uh, not weird but there's a peculiar level of individualism to it mm -hmm. and turian society conditions its members to own up to everything so th what that means is in mass effect one when saren lied about his involvement with the geth and eden prime and sovereign and etc it was one of the worst sins imaginable for his species it might explain why the turian counselor immediately dismissed such an idea because he he literally couldn't believe that a turian would be capable of uh, of, of such deceit and bold-faced lying mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. in fact the wiki says it in this quote turians who mur who murder will try to get away with it but if they're directly questioned most will confess to the crime yeah and there are human cultures that are more like that like in the united states we're very individualist and so you find that people will lie through their teeth in order to preserve themselves. Um, but there are cultures where you you corner somebody and they spill the beans because that's what that's what their world is like. Yeah, and it, because if they keep going, they are risking never being allowed basically back in the society at all. Right. Like it's better to fess up to the crime than to lose all honor, all honor and trust. It, you know, and trust. Yeah, nobody will yeah. ever trust them again. Yeah. And I think that kind of goes the same in American society a little bit. You know, but have you ever caught someone in a lie and you think, you know, if you just fessed up to it, right. I'd respect you more. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Especially especially in um, work environments, you know, like in uh, like corporate structure and having employees and, and doing those kinds of things. Like if you when you catch an employee doing something wrong, what you want them to do is fess up and then be honest about what they're going to do to fix it. Like that's, that's the best case scenario. Like if ever you mess up at work, that's the best thing to do for your boss is to just honestly say, you know what? I messed up. I wasn't doing what I should have done. Here's what I'm going to do to fix it and then fix it. If you dig your heels in, then you lose the potential for your boss to ever trust you because they caught you in it. They know, and you're not going to change their opinion by just holding on to the lie and digging your heels in. It doesn't work. Right. It's just like a, come on, man. You know, it, it's, it's just like, a, I really thought better of you than that. Right. Right. Um, and it, it's, I, I think it's disappointing above all else. So maybe the Turians feel the same way. Um, uh, when it comes to religion and, and Garrus actually mentioned, you know, if, if human heaven is the same thing like Turian heaven at all, it's funny that he says that because I'm not sure that Turians really believe in heaven like humans do. Turians have their own level of religion and spirituality, but they believe that groups and areas have spirits that transcend the individual. We already talked about Bushido. We already talked about some aspects that remind us of Japan. And, and yet here's another one because they don't believe in divine intervention. In that way, they're a little bit of deists. Uh, mm -hmm. And they don't believe the spirits are inherently good or evil. The spirits that are attached to places or it could even be a military unit who laid down their life in, in honor of sacrifice. And now that spirit embodies the word sacrifice. 
but they do believe that these spirits can inspire the living to act. So the living still have free will, but these spirits can inspire them to act. So some pray to the spirits and certain spirits for guidance. Now, Tom, you've studied religion a whole hell of a lot more than I have. Uh Uh, No pun intended. (laughs) (laughs) I like it. I like it. But um, this sounds like Shintoism, right? You know, I haven't thought about Shintoism in a long time. Um, I'd have to look up the details. But yeah, I, I mean, very much spiritual spirit kind of focused stuff. A lot of the Asian cultures have a what are what are generally considered the um, like nature religion like that are kind of like Shintoism, this idea that animism. They're, animism, they're they're worshiping the spirits of nature, the spirits of the world, the spirits of the animals, the spirits of their ancestors. Um, it's less structured in a like de- deistic kind of style where you have some sort of overarching deity god or pantheon of gods. It's more about the spirit underlying nature, the spirit of the wind, the spirit. And, and, and in some cases, it can be more developed, the spirit of this place, the spirit of this community, you know, like the spirit of the fox that inhabits the woods and protects the, you know, whatever, like those kinds of concepts. So... Um, yeah, I'd have to look more into specifically Shintoism in order to to remember exactly what that is. But I, I do believe it is uh, animalistic and spiritual focused. Yeah, and it's it's pantheistic as well, like you mentioned. Um, so it's not necessarily exclusionary, um, which is interesting because a lot of the world's primary religions are a little oh, yeah. exclusionary. Yeah, and and for um, people but, who don't understand what that means, that means like for somebody in in a Judeo Christian environment, like which most of the United States is you believe in your God and you believe all the, that all the other gods are false. They don't exist. You are an atheist to everything other than your God, your deity. Um, non-exclusionary faiths like Shintoism or Hinduism. If you, if, if I was a Hindu and, or a Shinto believer and um, Sam here was to say like, Hey, I'm, I'm a Catholic. I would respond. I wouldn't respond. Well, your God doesn't exist. I would respond. Well, that's cool. You worship your God. He, I'm sure he does something out there somewhere. These are my gods. <laughs> like, it doesn't mean that you're wrong because you have a different God. It just means that well, I don't know your God and you can have your other God. That's fine. These are mine. It's cool with me. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a really cool. Uh, it's a really cool concept and kind of bringing that all around. We've talked about a lot of things regarding the Turians. So considering that one, military members are highly revered in Turian society and those military members, at least the ones that see combat, never surrender. And two, traits like personal honor, discipline, and and work ethic are valued at the expense of personal expression and entrepreneurialism. And three, the concept of total war has permeated apparently not just their military strategy, but from what I've seen in the games, the take no prisoners type of attitude, Mm -hmm. it it, it permeates much more than that in in how Turians interact with, with, uh, with other beings. Just look at the Turian counselor, for example. Um, and, and four, their religious beliefs mirror pantheistic belief systems like Shintoism. Considering all these things, I think some fans would be justified in feeling that the Turians are analogous to widely circulated notions of what feudal and modern Japanese society is like. You know, and, and notice I put a caveat on there, the uh-huh. widely circulated notions. That's because I don't think it's a fair representation. It's just some of the characteristics. Um, if if we were to extrapolate, like, for example, if Japanese society during World War Two won the war and continued forward, then it might be much more like this. Um, it was that that side of the society, that side of like never giving up. Uh, one of the one of the justifications for dropping the bombs for the U.S. dropping the bombs in Japan, the nukes was to try to get them to give in because they didn't want to have to keep being at war. It was clear that the Japanese were not going to win, but they would not give in. They would have fought until the last man. And that's very similar to a lot of this kind of concept, this idea that, you know, we, the collective will continue to fight. We will not give in like that, that side of it. And it is interesting, too, because toward the end of World War II, there was a split within the Japanese government where the military yeah. arm was no longer listening to the civilian arm. 
Yes. And the civilian arm wasn't too thrilled about continuing the fight. Uh, they wanted to negotiate peace. Because they were the dying. They, they were dying, dying from firestorms and firebombs and then the nukes. And like there were many, many more people who died from just regular bombing. The United States was doing an atrocity when it came to the amount of, of ordinance being dropped on just the people, the towns oh, yeah. before the nukes even happened. And the firebombs were much deadlier. Oh, much deadlier. Much deadlier. But they, they weren't as scary because it wasn't a nuke. You know, it wasn't one gigantic right. explosion. But we were burning down entire communities and cities every day. And so and the building materials that that the, that Tokyo was made out of didn't help. Oh, yeah. And, and so, yeah, of course, of course, the populace was going, well, we need to have a voice in this. This this structure doesn't work anymore. And, and, and it makes sense because warfare had changed. When you can fly a plane over any location and bomb it to hell, that's very different than when you needed to put a bunch of samurai on horseback and ride into battle. Those are very different things. Yeah. Total war. Total um, war, yeah. And they weren't, you know, the, the Japanese, the Imperial Japanese were not the only ones who practiced total war and the Americans haven't been the only ones who practiced total war. Yeah. And the Romans certainly practiced total war. And so I think, you know, while I did say that some fans would be justifying and feeling that the Turans are analogous to the feudal and, and modern Japanese society, uh, I also think that the writers probably intended Turians to be likened to the Romans mostly. And I say this because Turian is reportedly based on the word centurion mm -hmm. and Palavin is a moniker for Palatine Hill. And that's the centermost hill of the seven hills that Rome was built on. Yeah, there's there's a mix of both. I think that it's um, oftentimes in in literature and fiction, it's not usually usually just a singular one to one correlation or at least in, I guess I should say more modern and <laughs> more researched and interesting versions of stories. It's usually certain aspects are pulled from some things and some from others. And it's it tends to be a mix of things. Yeah, agreed. Certainly. Um, and that was, you know, where where we were going to wrap this up is is basically what you just said, you know, is inspired by a mix of 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 human history's greatest. And I say greatest in, in quotes, you know, militaristic empires and societies. The basic common thread throughout all of that is that the player is supposed to know the Turians are an autocratic and uh, I'm sorry, not autocratic by, by definition, but rather authoritarian society. Mm -hmm. They greatly value authority and they greatly value uh, knowing one's place in the hierarchy. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Uh, you know, just like we mentioned during the show, um, the Japanese, the Romans, the USSR, the um, the Greeks who I lost their name again and it was just in my head. The Spartans. Spartans there they are. Uh, even the US in some ways. Yeah. Very cool. Very, very cool. I, I You know, everybody loves Garrus. So I think that Turians tend to be one of the more popular ones. But when you look at their society as a whole, there's it's very well organized and there are definitely just like any of any of these cultures there are things that are wonderful about it but then there are also things that are, seem to be very terrible like the kinds of things that they do when they go to war yeah uh, and you know for everyone that loves garris i hope that you listened to this episode because it's not i think you'll see that garris really is a rebel that he does not fit in with turian society all that well um all of the headbutting that he runs into at CSEC with the level of uh, collectivist notions that are so prevalent throughout Turian society. And the, and you, you couple that with the fact that Turians make up the vast majority of CSEC. And now you can kind of see why he was passed over for promotion so many times. Yeah. Yeah. Because he does not, you know, the, um, he, he's the, he's what's the saying the the, the nail that sticks out the farthest gets the hammer. <laughs> okay something like, something that. like that yeah the squeaky Basically, wheel gets the grease is that is that it I mean, it's like the opposite <laughs> it's the opposite of that <laughs> but basically he's not a, he's he's a rebel and he refuses to uh he has far too much personal expression and we'll put it this mm -hmm. way he thinks for himself too much and regardless of his position in in the hierarchy he believes that he knows better i mean i feel like even when you first meet him in mass effect one 
he has that air of like, I'm going to go off on my own and figure this out, which which the Turians would classify as arrogance. Oh, yeah. Like that doesn't fit in. It makes sense for you being able to like work with him. But among his peers, that that doesn't that seems odd. Like, why? Why would you go off on your own and do that? Why not stick with the collective? Yeah. The Moctopus says in chat here um, that he just did uh, that. Mo- the Moctopus just did his recruitment mission in Mass Effect 2. And the strategy that Garrus uses on Omega is totally in line with the Turian approach. I would agree with that. Um, whoever has not played the uh, recruitment uh, mission from for Garrus in Mass Effect 2, definitely go and check it out. Listen to every line of dialogue there. Um, and Commander Sovereign also says, yeah, Garrus even admits in Mass Effect 2, I'm not a very good Turian. Um, well, that's okay, because in some respects, no matter what you choose, Shepard isn't a very good human, is he? Um, you know, and in, in, in terms of what is expected of us as humans and what is expected of, of humans in the military. Um, yeah. Shepard often chooses the council over the alliance, no matter what you do. Um, he adheres to council authority, which Alliance hardliners don't like, but maybe that means Shepard's not a good, very good human, but that kind of <laughs> takes us to, to next week. Next week. Uh, we we've discussed at this point, we've discussed all of the council races. The Turians were the third to join the council. Um, we didn't really go over the Krogan rebellions or the other conflicts that the Turians were really known for because we've already covered that in previous episodes. But at this point, we have covered all the council races. And so now I think we're, we're set to move on to the non-council races. And I think it makes the most amount of sense to start with the Volus. Uh, the reason being is because not just are the Volus the client race of the Turians, but partly because of that, they're the first race outside of the council races to found an embassy on the Citadel. Mm-hmm. And, they're, and they're super cute. Oh, yeah. They breathe through rebreathers and sound like quirky little Darth Vader's. Yeah, and their their bodies are shaped kind of like Danny DeVito. So that's fun too. Really are. They really are. <laughs> they really they, are. They, they're basically like little Danny DeVitos. Danny um, DeVolis. Danny DeVolis. <laughs> oh man. Oh boy. Well, this has been awesome. Uh, of course, I've learned more things on this episode again. So thank you for putting the show notes together. And do you have anything cool going on? Anything you want to share? before we head out? Well, I think we both do. Uh, do you want to, uh, we, we can talk about, we do. So Tom and I have this new show coming out, um, tomorrow night, same time, uh, same start time anyway, 10 30 PM Eastern, 7 30 Pacific. Yep. We are pioneering something called the Xbox game pass show. Xbox game pass show. This is going to be your source for everything. Xbox game pass. Any news about Xbox game pass? Expe- the game pass is developed to a point now where it is kind of a go-to resource for anybody outside of uh, PlayStation or Nintendo framework. If you play on PC, if you play on Xbox, or if you even play games on your phone because you can remote connect to the cloud using apps on your phone, which I've done and is freaking amazing because you can just pair a controller with your phone and just play stuff. Um, So we both I, I have Xbox Game Pass on PC. He uses it on console. We're going to be coming from different perspectives on this. We're going to be covering all of the new games that are coming out, all the games that will be leaving, any big news about it. And we also will be talking each week about games that we've tried out and giving you some first impressions of some of the stuff that we've played and things that might be worth your time to check out. And in on our streams, I know uh, throughout the week, whenever I do game streams, I'll be trying out some of these games on stream as well. So um, are you going to do the same? Th- I know you're still working your way like through Mass Effect, but sorry. Yeah, I'll also be I'll also be trying out the new games. Uh, well, not new games, but they're new to me. Um, so yeah. I'll be trying out a lot of the Game Pass games. And I think a lot of the a lot of the games on Game Pass kind of provide a, a lot of good crossover for the other shows on the network. Right. Right. And a lot of those games you can play on other systems as well. So even if you don't have Game Pass, if we're reviewing something like Red Dead Online, that's something you can play everywhere. So a lot of the games actually work for everything, even if you don't have Xbox. And I wouldn't be surprised if we're not going to get some sort of announcement about xbox i mean there's been rumors that they're tr- microsoft is trying to work out deals with nintendo and sony to get game pass on those systems as well which would be amazing so and it's not just xbox it's yeah like i said it's all sorts of things including playing games on your phone and it 
I loaded up Red Dead Redemption 2 online on my phone the other day with a controller. And you know, you know what most game graphics look like on your phone. Well, when you see full, full, awesome level Red Dead graphics on your on your phone, on your phone. Can I did I say that it's on your phone? When you look at the the sunsets and the backgrounds and the horses and the animations, it's just it's kind of breaks your brain a little bit. And the delay is so small. It is so, so small. It, I don't know how they do it. It's just magic. But we're going to be talking about this stuff tomorrow night. It's going to be awesome. Aww. We'll be doing this every week and you will be able to get this. It's not obviously not up yet. Tomorrow's the first episode, but you will be able to listen to it on whatever platform you normally listen to your shows on. So whether it's watching the videos on the YouTube channel, the Robots Radio YouTube channel, or if it's listening on iTunes or Spotify or whatever other podcatcher or checking out our shows live here, you'll be able to do that as well. So we'll have our hands full yeah. um, because E3 is just right around the corner. Uh, yes. And it's not just and I think we need to reiterate this. So even though the show is, is going to be called Xbox Game Pass show, that is because the product is called Xbox Game Pass, even though Xbox Game Pass uh, applies to Xbox PC and phone. Right. And I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure I, I need to double check this, but I'm pretty sure you only need to pay for the subscription once. Right. And then you get it on your Xbox. And if you have an Xbox and PC, you mm-hmm. get it on both. Yep. Yep. And on your phone. In fact, right now, the way I signed up for it right now, it's a dollar for three months of Game Pass premium. One dollar for three months of games on all those different setups. So it's I don't know. That's a killer deal even for just trying it out. Um, so, yeah, if, if you pay for ultimate, you get all that stuff. It's it's only 15 bucks if you want to pay for the subscription, but it's also cool because you could just do it for a month, play whatever games you want to play for that month and then, you know, just stop playing, like end the subscription and then come back later when there's another game that gets added to it that you want to play, but you want to pay full price for it. So especially games that are like single player where you're just going to play through it once and then you're going to be done with it and you're going to burn through it in a week or two. That's a super deal. That's like so it's it's a no brainer. Why pay 60 bucks when you can pay 15? Um, as, you know, and especially if you just have a phone, you just want to play some of those games on your phone and you don't even have a, a console that can play it like you could totally do that, too. It's way cheaper. It's I mean, it's just and amazing. The games, the games aren't all equal in size. Some are definitely smaller indie games, maybe mm-hmm. platformer games I've seen. And so I think, you know, I've seen a couple questions in chat. Are we going to review the games? Yes, uh, we will, especially the games, you know, that we can speak on that we've played. Um, but I think the smaller indie games, you know, will give them the the appropriate proportional amount of time. But the larger games, like let's say the Halo Master Chief Collection, I don't know. I think that's on Game Pass. I, I know that yes. there's a lot of Halos. On yeah, Game there's Pass. a bunch of Halos. Yeah, um, that certainly warrants a lot more coverage, uh, just because it's a lot more content. Yeah, and we're not gonna have obviously. There's so many games on there. We're not gonna have time to play through all of the games all the way. So a lot of what we will be doing is checking out especially the new games as they come out, giving our first impressions. And obviously if we play all the way through something, we're going to note it and we'll be like, I like this one so much that I played all the way through it, but we only have so many hours in the day, right? There's only, there's only so much the two of us can do, but we would love to get your feedback on it as well. If you've been playing game pass games and want to send us stuff about your experiences with those games, what you think about them, we might even highlight that on the show. You know, the show's brand new. There's a lot that we haven't even put together yet. So there's going to be a lot going on there. So we hope you guys come and join us for that. I have a feeling it's going to be a really good time. And if you want to check us out playing some of these games to see if it's even something worth picking up or finding out which games are available on which platforms, because some of them are, are console, some of them are, are only console, so they don't come to PC. Some of them some of them are, ne- are actually work with touch on your phone, and some of them need a controller. So you can find out information about that stuff as well. There's all We'll be doing a whole bunch of stuff with this stuff, but we, we'll be back tomorrow night. So come hang out with us here tomorrow night, and I think we've said enough about it. Can you tell we're excited? We're excited about this. This is going to be fun. Oh, yeah. And Mass Effect is on Game Pass uh, because of EA Play. Yep. Yep. And I do shows about Fallout and Elder Scrolls. All those all the Bethesda stuff is now on Game Pass. A bunch of it. Doom. I reloaded Doom back up. Uh, Doom Eternal. Phenomenal game. There's just so much good stuff out there. Um, I haven't played Doom yet. I mean, oh, my God. Oh, my God, dude. Doom is Doom is the game to play 
when you just need to kill a bunch of things when you're just like you know i'm just gonna i'm just gonna murder a bunch of demons because that's what you do to demons you murder them and they need to fear me like when you feel like somebody needs to be afraid of me right now and i need to blow everything up you play doom yeah absolutely um oh yeah and there will be a witcher lore cast we're going to be launching that in the next few weeks so that'll be also on monday nights that'll be before the the game pass show on monday nights and i think the is the witcher still on game pass i think so i know it was on there a while ago i don't know if it's still on but I feel like the last time i looked it was um there's a lot of yeah. really i like have a list of games that i want to play on game pass similar to my list on netflix and i feel like it's going to be that kind of thing where I keep adding things to the list and I can never actually make a dent in it. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it's got something for everyone. Oh, and by the way, um, if you have been playing a game and you don't have game pass, but the game you've been playing is on game pass. Oh yeah. Let us know about that too. Oh yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. Share any of that stuff with us. All right, guys, we're going to head out. Thanks for being here. We love chatting with you guys and you know, maybe we need to plan some time at the end of the show to do more of these, just like talking with the, with the uh the twitch stream chat because you guys are, are fun um but we're gonna get headed out we'll see you guys tomorrow night and if we don't see you tomorrow night we'll see you back here next week and if we don't see you at all then we are seeing you through your ear holes somehow and it's really mysterious because it's, we're like weird aliens that can see through your ear holes all right see you guys later bye everyone bye bye Thanks for tuning in to the Mass Effect Lorecast. We'd love to hear your opinion and thoughts on the lore of Mass Effect. Reach out to us on Twitter at Mass Effect Cast or check out the Robots Radio Discord. Also, you can send us an email at MassEffectLorecast at gmail.com.